On behalf of our center and the International House and Seminary Co-op Bookstore, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this late afternoon's uh, World Beyond the Headlines event. Stephen Wax on his book, Kafka Comes to America, Fighting for Justice in the War on Terror. We hope that you will also join us for our final World Beyond the Headlines, which is next Tuesday, when we will welcome Ahmed Rashid, um, discussing his book, Descent into Chaos, the United States and the Failure of Nation Building in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. Today's event, as always, is being audio and video recorded for broadcast on the web. You, you will be able to see and hear this program again by going online to the University of Chicago's International and Area Studies Multimedia Outreach Source, otherwise known as Chiasmos, and that's at chiasmos.uchicago.edu. And all of these audio and video files are posted and available for free download or for streaming at no charge. In his book, Kafka Comes to America, Fighting for Justice in the War on Terror, Stephen Wax questions how our country has come to its current state. He points to facts that under the current Bush administration, not only are the civil rights of foreigners in jeopardy, but so are those of US citizens. Stephen Wax is in his seventh term as the federal public defender for the District of Oregon. He was a key part of the Brooklyn, New York District Attorney's prosecution of David Berkowitz, AKA Son of Sam. Wax and his team are currently representing seven men held as enemy combatants in Guantanamo. He has taught at Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College, serves as an ethics prosecutor for the Oregon State Bar, and lectures throughout the country. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Wax. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be in Chicago. I must say, though, that I haven't had a shirt plastered to me since I uh, was in Sudan uh, a year ago. In the great Northwest, uh, we have a lot of water that comes down as rain. Uh, I'm not sure which is better or worse, the rain or the humidity, and, and which there is more of. But my shirt is dry now. I'd like to thank the uh, International House, the Center for International Studies, and the bookstore for uh, the invitation to be here. And I think that some of what I am going to be speaking about is directly relevant to some of their interests and hopefully some of yours. Over the next 45 minutes or so, I plan to introduce you to several of the clients I have represented in the War on Terror. I also plan to introduce you to some of the issues that are present in their cases, issues that have to do with the tension between security and liberty, issues that I believe are of fundamental importance to all of us here in America. Let me start by taking you back, if you can hear me over this wonderful gale that's blowing outside, um, a little more than two years ago. I stepped into a noisy little 15-seater airplane flown by Lynx Airways out of Fort Lauderdale for the trip all the way around Cuba, past the eastern shore, down to the southern shore, to the U.S. Naval Base in Guantanamo. We couldn't get there in 45 minutes, which is about all it would take from Fort Lauderdale, because U.S.-Cuba relations are such that we cannot cross Cuban airspace. Landed at the airfield at the base in Guantanamo at dusk, and I was met by a military escort who checked to make sure that I had with me the FBI security clearance, which is necessary in order to land on the base, and that I also had the military clearance, which is necessary to set foot on the base. The escort drove me and my colleagues from the Defender Office to the combined bachelor quarters, which is a funky little hotel on the leeward side of the base where we spend our time when we're visiting our clients. Up the next morning to take the 7.40 a.m. bus down to the ferry terminal, a rickety old school bus painted white driven by a Jamaican contract worker who, when I asked, told me he was paid the magnificent sum of $2.59 an hour by our government, which it seems to me is a little bit below any minimum wage uh, in the country itself. Got onto the ferry, crossed the bay, takes about 15 minutes over to the windward side of the base, which is the heart of the base at Guantanamo. And it's also the part of the base where the prison is located 
where the prisoners are housed. We were met by another military escort on the windward side. We were given badges and taken in a bus, driven through what looked like anywhere USA, any small town, any small military base in the southwest, because the naval base in Guantanamo is in a dry part of Cuba, where the predominant vegetation looks like some sort of uh, scrubby uh, Segura cactus, not the giant majestic things one sees in southern Arizona, but little scrubby, funkier sorts of plants. You go through a town that has a McDonald's, it has a QFC, and as a person from the great northwest where coffee is king, you actually go past a Starbucks. And the debate on most mornings was whether or not breakfast would come from the Starbucks or from the subway. First morning we stopped at the Starbucks. I don't drink coffee so I didn't really care, but I got a cup of tea and then I asked for a scone. Because at least where I come from, Starbucks baked goods are uh, part of the fun. The person sort of looked at me quizzically and pointed to the shelf behind her where there were nothing more than cellophane wrapped things that looked like they come from uh, a Costco and may have been baked two years before with a lot of preservatives in them. They insisted it was real coffee. I don't know. You then drive through the town and past subdivisions with very nice, pleasant names like Iguana Terrace and Sunrise Terrace. Down a road, around a few corners, until you see down a hill a military check station where there are people, men and women, with large fixed machine guns, other people carrying M16s, and a person with a sidearm came onto the bus to check our badges. Not quite sure to me why that extra level of check is needed since we weren't able to even get onto the airplane and set foot on the base without the necessary clearances, but they checked our badges nonetheless. And you see off in the distance from there, the prison. Chain link fence, razor wire on top, multiple sets of the chain link fence with razor wire in between. You turn another corner and you see, and this is in this first visit, March of 2006, two standard issue federal prisons under construction. Today, those standard issue federal prisons are where the majority of the men in Guantanamo are housed. So if you hear the Bush administration saying that they're planning to shut down Guantanamo, it seems to me that their actions in terms of this expensive construction may belie their words. You take another turn and you pull up to Camp Echo which is the part of the prison where in 2006 most of the visits with the prisoners took place. And I was there to meet a man my government had labeled one of the worst of the worst, former Secretary of Rumsfeld's phrase. A man my government in the form of our president, our vice president, our secretary of defense had labeled one of the hardened fighters, an Al-Qaeda member, a Taliban fighter, one of the men they said who had been picked up on the battlefield in Afghanistan fighting against the United States, the Northern Alliance, and our allies in the war that commenced with our presence in October of 2001 after the World Trade Center and Pentagon bombings. The reality about the overwhelming majority of the men who are housed in Guantanamo, as I got into this case, is that fewer than 8% are or were Al-Qaeda fighters. And that figure does not come from me. That does not come from a defense attorney's musings about what might be. It comes from a study that was conducted by some professors, Denbo, who have published, and you can find this online, based on the military's unclassified data about the Guantanamo prisoners. Fewer than 8% were Al-Qaeda. 
And notwithstanding the fact that our government leaders told us repeatedly that these were men picked up on the battlefield, fewer than 5% were actually picked up on a battlefield by United States forces. The overwhelming majority were turned over to us by Afghani and Pakistani people. And many were sold to us, and I mean that literally, sold to us for bounties of $5,000 or more. And you can find the bounty post posters posted online. In terms of what has been charged, and I use the word charge loosely as a lawyer, it doesn't really fit, but in lay terms, what our government says these people did, the allegations against them, fewer than 50% are even alleged by our government to have committed a hostile act. Yet these are the men repeatedly said by the top leaders of our government to all be hardened fighters taken from a battlefield. My client, one of the seven my office and I have represented there, Adil Hassan Hamad, a Sudanese charity worker, is one of the men against whom our government has made allegations generally along with the others. The specific allegations that were filed against him were that he was a charity worker, that he worked as a hospital administrator, that he worked as a teacher for two charities, one of which two years after he left was designated as a terrorist organization. But he is not alleged to have done anything other than work for those charities. Some members of those charities are alleged to have made anti-American and anti-Israeli statements. Not my client. When I got into the prison that first day in March of 2006, after yet two more sets of checks, you go into an inner courtyard with a concrete path that surrounds some gravel. Now, I had been told by lawyers who had been there before me, Steve, when you get there, stay on the concrete path. The gravel is mined just in case someone wants to make a break for it. Something else which I was somewhat uh, interested in hearing and, and, you know, is this real, is this not real? I did not step off the path to check. And notwithstanding the fact that on nearly all of my visits, I asked the military guards who were there, hey, guys, is this mined? I never got an answer. So I don't know. Maybe it's a rumor. Around a corner and up to one of the wooden structures that is in Camp Echo, roughly 20 by 40 foot structures, each one divided in half, led by the escort up to door number 12. The door opened, and I saw on the inside a little formica table a metal folding chair without cushions behind the table, an eye hook bolted into the floor. And seated in that room, in that chair behind the table, I saw a dark-skinned man with dark black close-cropped hair and a short dark beard wearing a white shirt and white pants and a white kufi. I was somewhat surprised to see a man who looked like an African because I expected to go meet a Sudanese Arab. Perhaps that's the inherent racism that I carry, that I think we all carry. My expectation of an Arab was a lighter-skinned person, but I've learned a bit culturally about Sudan and the Sudanese Arabs along the way here. The man seated behind that table, Adel Hassan Hamad, known in the government lexicon as prisoner number 940, I have come to know as a loving husband, a loving father of four daughters, and indeed a charity worker and hospital administrator. Let's shift frames for a minute. Because Adel Hassan Hamad was not the first man my officer or I had represented in the war on terror. 
As I've said, I got to meet him in March of 2006. Our involvement with the War on Terror began within one month of the attacks on the Trade Towers and the Pentagon. Now, here in Chicago, you may view Oregon as this wonderful green place out on the Pacific Ocean full of bean sprouts and people wandering around in sandals and uh, eating granola and stuff, but apparently we have had uh, a number of homegrown terrorists. We've also had a number of people who have been falsely accused. Our involvement started, as I said, within a month of the September 11 attacks. And it continued over the next three years, 2001, 2, and 3, with the prosecution of a man my office represented who was convicted not of anything related to terrorism but of possessing a gun, the government never coming in and putting up any evidence of terrorism. Portland saw the prosecution and conviction of a group of men and one woman known first as the Portland Six, then as the Portland Seven, people who actually did go to China trying to get into Afghanistan to, draw, to join the jihad in 2001 and early 2002. A sheikh who was arrested at the Portland airport, headlines trumpeted about explosives being found in his luggage. Several weeks later, egg dripping off their faces, the government had to admit there were no explosives found. That sheikh eventually pled guilty to making a false statement on an immigration document some 10 or 15 years before. And then, in March of 2004, some of you may recall, there were bombings in Madrid, Spain. Seven train stations, bombs exploded. 191 people were killed. 2,000 people were wounded. Three Americans were among those who died. The Spanish police immediately started a full court press investigation and they were fortunate enough to find a bag of unexploded detonators at one of the train stations. And from that bag of unexploded detonators, they were able to lift several latent fingerprints. They started an investigation. They didn't come up with a match immediately. So they sent those latent prints out electronically to fellow law enforcement agencies around the world through Interpol. One of the agencies that received those prints was our Federal Bureau of Investigation. Three days after the bombings, Spain had a national election. They voted in a new government. That new government pulled its troops out of what our president called the coalition of the willing in Iraq. As you may recall that in 2004, the war in Iraq was still going on. I don't recall if that was before or after mission accomplished. I think it was probably after that was said. And that fact, I believe, played a significant part in what eventually happened to the man who became my client with respect to the Madrid bombings, Portland attorney Brandon Mayfield. Because seven weeks after the bombings and 7,000 miles away in Portland, Oregon, Brandon Mayfield, born in Oregon, raised in Kansas, a white man, raised as a Christian, who had married an Egyptian woman whose father was a professor in the state of Washington. She was Muslim and Brandon converted to Islam. They had three children. Brandon joined the army. Brandon left the army as a lieutenant, 10 years service to his country. He went to law school and graduated went to work for a small firm in Oregon, and then set up his own little practice. And on May 6th of 2004, he suffered the knock on the door that I know I've read about in other countries with oppressive regimes, whether they be the old East Germany, Soviet Union, or other places. A knock on the door by the FBI arresting him on a material witness warrant. A material witness warrant that alleged that he was a person of interest 
in a crime of international terrorism, a crime that would carry the death penalty. That was in the documents. He was told that capital murder was what it was that the government was interested in him for. That arrest warrant, or more specifically the affidavit that was filed with the court in order to support his arrest, said that the FBI had taken this latent print that the Spanish had sent over. They had run it through the national database that has 45 or 50 million fingerprints in it. Fingerprints of people such as myself who are lawyers, who are fingerprinted to be admitted to the bar. Fingerprints of people who are in other professions that require that prints be taken. Fingerprints of people in the United States military and fingerprints of people who have been arrested and convicted of crimes. The FBI said that after running his print through that database, the computer spat out some possibles. Three senior FBI examiners had looked at the latent, compared it to Brandon's print, and concluded with 100% certainty. Let me repeat, with 100% certainty. Now, I, as a criminal defense attorney and as a prosecutor, have worked with experts now for 35 years. And I had never before, in either capacity, seen an expert say anything with 100% certainty. Scientists, doctors, serologists, whatever they are, talk about things to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, whatever that means, but never 100% certainty. But that's what the FBI said. And in the affidavit that they submitted to the court, they also said that Brandon is a, Mus Brandon is a Muslim, had been seen going to mosque, had represented a man convicted of terrorism, and that the man who had been convicted of terrorism, whom Brandon had represented in a child custody battle, held some pretty strong anti-American and anti-Jewish positions. Not that Brandon did, but that his client did. So when I walked into the Multnomah County Jail in downtown Portland, Oregon on May 7th to meet Brandon, all that I knew, if I knew anything that was fact, was what was said in that affidavit, which included this 100% identification. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Brandon and Adele for you know, a little bit later on in this talk. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more directly about some of the policies of the Bush administration, how it's attempted to shift the balance of power between we the citizens and the government, and attempted to shift the balance of power between the executive and the Congress and between the executive and the judiciary. But before getting into that, I want to take another frame shift. And I want to answer a question that I am asked whenever I speak, and that is, how did I, the Federal Defender for the District of Oregon, come to represent people in Guantanamo? And why did I, both as a human being and as the federal defender, think it was important to get involved in that work? To answer that question, I'm going to take you back now nearly 40 years. I am a child of the 60s, and I am proud of it. I grew up infused with the idealism of that time and with the anger of that time. I think that the anger has dissipated as I have grown older. I don't think the idealism has. Roughly 40 years ago when I was getting ready to go off to law school, I filled out an application that required an essay. Why, the essay said, do you want to go to law school? And in answering that question, I talked about my grandfather. If any of you were kind enough to buy the book and actually look at the dedication page, you'll see that it's dedicated to Jack 
and Julius. Julius is my mother's father. Julius was born in Russia. And as a kid, I looked up to this giant of a man who I don't think was ever more than five feet tall in his life. And by the time I was able to recall him, I'm sure that uh, his spine had shrunk a little and he was less than five feet tall. But he was always a giant in my eyes because of the story that I heard about the time that he was in the Tsar's army, drafted into the Tsar's army, and suffering the anti-Semitism that was meted out by the officers. And he took it, and he took it, until one day he could take it no more. In a chow line, having just gotten up to the front, the lieutenant says to him, Jid, get out of line and get to the latrines, clean them out, then you can get back to the end. And he not only said no, but he went after that lieutenant in such a way that the lieutenant did not get up. And little Julius, the giant in my eyes, was then spirited out of the camp, out of Russia. I am always told that he had the proper papers when he came to the US. I certainly hope so, but the statute of limitations would have run in any event uh, long before he died uh, 25 or so years ago. But I heard that story. Later, when I was a little bit older, I learned how my great-grandfather was murdered in a pogrom and the role of the Russian government in that. And that's what I wrote about in my law school essay. Why do I want to be a lawyer? Because the rule of law is what keeps us all free. The rule of law is what keeps us all safe. And I want to fight for these principles. I want to help people, and I want to fight for these principles. I saw the law as a vehicle for social change. I saw the law as a vehicle necessary to protect us all. I graduated from law school. I clerked for a year, and then I became a prosecutor. Spent four years in Brooklyn, New York, where there is nothing but real crime, or at least there wasn't back in the 1970s, prosecuting anything and everything, and spending two years working on two of the largest prosecutions of mass murderers in the city at the time. One was David Berkowitz. The other was a man who killed far more people than Berkowitz, a black man who murdered black and Puerto Rican people, so did not receive the notoriety that Berkowitz, the white man who killed white people, received. I worked with some very good police officers, very good prosecutors. But I also saw the corruption. I saw the abuse that can take place. And I saw the pain inflicted on the people who were the consumers of justice, the defendants in the cases. 30 years ago, I left that office, became a county public defender in New York, and 25 years ago moved out to Oregon. And along the way in my career, I think that I have had the opportunity to help a few people. I've had the opportunity to shape the law a little bit. But there was no way that I could have known when I went off to law school that time ago that I would end up shortly after September 11, representing a series of Muslim men accused of and linked to terrorist acts in cases that would put into high relief all of the important issues that are present in every criminal case. Cases that for me made it as clear as it ever was that the rights at issue are the rights that belong to all of us. Much harder to see when representing a rapist or a robber than in representing a person who is involved in a much more purely political prosecution. All right, shift focus again, back to Brandon for a minute. And pardon me, but it's getting warm again. Representing Brandon in the grand jury matter was perhaps the most intense two weeks of my legal career. I assembled a team of lawyers and investigators in the office to try to figure out what on earth 
is going on here. Is this his fingerprint? If so, how did it get there? And you know, how we filed the hundreds of pages of motions we filed in that short time, got into Brandon's civil practice, brought in the state bar to help him with his clients. So he had cases pending in the very federal courthouse where he was appearing in that proceeding, dealing with his family, dealing with the Muslim community in Oregon, which was incredibly upset at yet another arrest of a Portland Muslim. A remarkably intense time. And I want to read to you a passage from the book that I think captures some of the intensity of what we were dealing with. This passage describes one of the first meetings, if not the first meeting, with Brandon in the county jail. One of my senior assistant defenders, Chris Schatz, and I were meeting with Brandon. It was tough to talk to Brandon about the possibility of a death penalty charge. It's like a doctor telling a patient with what he thinks is a routine stomach ache that he has pancreatic cancer. While the death penalty hovered over our discussions, as long as Brandon was treated as a witness, it stayed somewhere off in the distance. But more immediate and even more difficult to talk to Brandon about was the possibility that we might not ever get to see him again. A possibility made real by the policies of the Bush administration. On April 20 and 28, less than two weeks before Brandon's arrest, Solicitor General Ted Olson and his chief deputy, Paul Clement, had argued to the Supreme Court on behalf of the president and his administration that the president had the power to take or order anyone, including US citizens arrested in the United States, out of the federal court, and hold them indefinitely in military detention without charges or trial. I told Brandon about the argument and that it's possible you won't be here tomorrow. In light of the administration's stance, I had to add, Brandon, this is real. They've actually done it. Hamdi and Padilla, two men, two US citizens, one arrested I believe here in Chicago, the other in Afghanistan, brought to Guantanamo and held indefinitely until they put him into a naval brig, are in the naval brig. Trained in the law and believing in American justice, Brandon could not accept what I had said. But I am a United States citizen. So are they. It doesn't matter. His voice rising, he barked back, I am a lawyer. I have cases pending in the federal court next door. I understand. This is the new reality. We have to deal with it, Brandon. We need a plan. If anyone comes to take you out of the jail, ask who they are and where they are taking you. They probably won't tell you, but try. Politely, but firmly, try to call us. Brandon's case became a symbol nationally of the excesses and dangers of the war on terror for several reasons. One had to do with the Patriot Act, passed shortly after September 11, amended some provisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and created something called sneak and peek warrants. Sneak and peek, meaning exactly what those words mean in common parlance. In the normal situation, when the police conduct an arrest, excuse me, a search, they have a warrant, and they show the warrant when they knock on the door. Or if they're allowed to go in without knocking, they have to leave the warrant. Either way, the subject of the search knows it's taken place, but not with sneak and peek. Now, law enforcement officers are authorized to go into a person's home as they did twice to the Mayfields, and leave no notice. 
They took from the Mayfields DNA swabs. They mirrored hard drives on computers. They took things written in Spanish, which turned out to be one of Brandon's children's homework. Now, how's that for an excuse? Uh, teacher, the FBI took it. I can't hand it in. But it's real. It happened. In early April, Mona Mayfield, working as office manager for Brandon in his law practice, came home, put the key in the lock, turned it, the door wouldn't open. Huh? Someone had thrown the deadbolt, a deadbolt the Mayfields never use. When she finally got in, she saw the digital clocks blinking. Huh? Someone messed with the electricity. Brandon came home that night, they talked, you know, wh what is this? What's going on? Someone clearly had been in their house, but nothing had been taken. All right, is this real? Is this not real? Are they imagining it? They went about their lives. A week later, it happened again. And this time, she saw footprints in some deep pile carpet in the living room. None of the kids had been home from school. There's no way those carpets had been marked by the Mayfield family. Imagine the terror that they felt that night. Imagine going home. Your home has been intruded into. Nothing has been taken. Who? Why? That's what they felt, that terror. And as it turned out, as the government later revealed, indeed, they had been victimized twice by sneak and peek searches. Brandon's case became a subject of national debate because of concern about religious profiling. From the outset, Brandon saying, they're doing this to me because I'm Muslim. Did they or did they not? What did they know? The FBI has never been subjected to cross-examination in any court about this. In affidavits, the agents who did the fingerprint examination said they did not know anything about Brandon before the print match was made. But the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, who did a report on the Mayfield matter that was published in 2006 and is available online, asked about religious profiling in his investigation. Asked people in Portland, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, and asked people in Washington, D.C. Many said religion had nothing to do with it. Some, in my judgment, were more honest and said, yes, it did. And part of what it did was help put the blinders on the investigation. Oh boy, we've got a fingerprint match. By God, he's a Muslim. We must have the right guy. Some people were honest enough to admit that thoughts like that cross their mind. And that's part of the danger, the excess, how the zeal to solve a crime, how looking at such things as religion can skew an investigation, and how in this instance led to a horrible mistake that turned a man's life upside down. Shift the frame again. Let's move from Brandon Mayfield in 2004 back to Adel Hamad and the other prisoners in Guantanamo. After we won Brandon's release from the jail, after the FBI apologized, after he got civil attorneys into the case who sued the government and said, give him some money for what you did to him, and the government did settle and provide a, handsy, a handsome settlement and a formal apology to him, something quite unusual. After we transferred the case, about a year went by, and I got a call from my counterpart in Washington, D.C., A.J. Kramer, the head of the Federal Defender Office there. Steve? Do you think your office could help out with some Guantanamo prisoners? Hmm. Why am I getting that call? What's going on? So shift this frame back a couple of years. 
Shift this frame back to late 2001 and January of 2002, when we're gathering up men, some by our soldiers from the battlefield, most from the Afghanis and the Pakistanis. We have to do something with them. What did we do? We put them in Guantanamo. Why? Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said, it's the least worst place to hold them. Now, I love that phraseology, the least worst place. Why? Guantanamo, you can't get there. Remember, I couldn't go until I had been cleared by both the FBI and the military. No reporters, no pickets, no protest, no visitors, no lawyers. Not one lawyer allowed on that base to see a client for two full years. But we lawyers are sometimes a cantankerous bunch. We lawyers sometimes push the law. And that started within a month of the delivery of the first prisoners there. A group in New York City, the Center for Constitutional Rights, filed habeas corpus petitions at the request of the families of a number of British prisoners. The Kuwaiti government hired a large law firm in Washington, D.C. that did civil and oil work for it to file petitions on behalf of some of its citizens. And a number of big law firms, mainly on the East Coast, some here in Chicago, joined in on a pro bono basis. For two years, the lawyers said to the court in Washington, D.C., these men are entitled to some process. The writ of habeas corpus gives them the right to have an independent federal judge review what the president has done. And for two years, the Bush administration said to the federal courts, nope. For two years, the Bush administration said, the writ of habeas corpus is not available in Guantanamo. The Geneva Conventions and the Conventions Against Torture do not apply to these men. For two years, the Bush administration said they are not prisoners of war, entitled to no rights. For two years, the Bush administration said that the president as commander in chief had the unilateral power to seize these men to imprison them with no process, and I mean that literally, no process, and hold them indefinitely. One of the lawyers in early on, Joe Margulies, is uh, here in Chicago. I don't think he's at this wonderful university, but he is a resident of your fair city. Joe was in on it from the beginning. June of 2004, one of the cases that Joe was involved with the Supreme Court says to the Bush administration, you're wrong. The men are entitled to process. They are entitled to habeas corpus. More pro bono lawyers got in. The men in Guantanamo were told that they could petition. And around 50 of them picked up scraps of paper and wrote out handwritten petitions to the district court in Washington, D.C. saying, help, in one way or another, help, I'm innocent. Let me go home. That's when the court turned back to CCR, to the pro bono lawyers, and said, can you take on some more? They said, sorry, we're full up. They turned to my counterpart. He said, I can take three. And the call went out. And I volunteered my office. Around 30 defender offices said, yes, we can help out. 14 ended up with cases, and we ended up with seven. On that first visit that I made in March of 2006, when I went down to see Adele and a number of my colleagues in the office went to see some of our other clients, we did not know if we were going to be representing terrorists or innocent men. And it did not matter. We were going there to represent, to work for the rule of law. We were going there to argue if they are terrorists, charge them, prosecute them, and sentence them. But you cannot hold them without charge and without process. The reality is that for most of our clients, it turned out 
that they were innocent. And that makes it easier, but it's certainly not necessary. Now, I would not have stood up here in front of you at the outset and said, I represented an innocent client in Guantanamo. I only do that because I sent a team of lawyers and investigators into the war zones of Afghanistan and Pakistan, into the United Arab Emirates, and I traveled personally to Sudan. We gathered evidence of innocence. We found the doctors with whom my client worked as the hospital administrator, doctors who abhorred the Taliban, doctors who were not only apolitical but anti-Taliban. Others were apolitical. Doctors who said, my client is a wonderful, peace-loving man. We talked to Afghan ministers. We confirmed that the hospital where he worked had received aid from and through the United Nations the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, that he had actually distributed supplies stamped United States of America. Supplies that had not been stolen, I should probably add, because that does happen in the world. I want to read to you a passage from one of the doctors we talked to about uh, Otto. The team that went to Afghanistan and Pakistan included investigator William Teasdale. That's the William who appears in this paragraph. The names of the doctors he met and interviewed were Dr. Najib, Najibullah, uh, the director of the hospital, Dr. Salani, and Dr. Rahman. The hospital was located in Chamkenai, Afghanistan. William came back with the videos. Weeks later, when I watched the video of the interview with Dr. Rahman, I was struck by his emotion as he recalled Adel. Rahman told William how disappointed he was when his second daughter was born. Afghan and Muslim men prefer a son, he said. When he had shared his disappointment with Adel at the hospital in Chamkenai, Adel would have none of it. You should not be disappointed, Adel told Rahman. She is a gift of the merciful Allah. No person alone can create such a being. It is that openness and reverence for life that we heard repeated time and again about Adel. Dr. Rockman was the third of the doctors from Chomkinai who gave William a sworn statement. The second, Dr. Sailani, like Dr. Najib, was in Kabul. And like Najib and Rockman, he was very troubled that Adel was in prison. I think he is a very good man, he told William. I never heard anything political from his mouth. Adel's prowess at ping pong had also impressed Dr. Sailani. Abu Dujana, which is Adel's nickname, was very smart in ping pong. Gesturing with his hand on the video, he went on, I play hard, but he defeat. He defeat. He own me in ping pong. <laughs> That's the man our government accused of being a terrorist. Now, after the first visit in Guantanamo, our notes had to go through censors. Unlike every other attorney-client communication which is privileged, the attorney-client meetings in Guantanamo are not. Among the things we were able to bring back from Adel's memory was a phone number for his brother-in-law in Khartoum. We made contact with the brother-in-law, and then his wife, and then spoke by phone with two of the oldest daughters before, a year later, we were able to get over there and actually meet them. And one of the things about the war on terror, one of the things about the process that our country is employing that is not always recognized is that we're dealing not only with the men in Guantanamo, the human beings such as Adel who are charity workers and hospital administrators, but their families. I want to read to you a couple of passages from the book that relate to 
Adel's wife and daughters that capture their experience of this. Adel was arrested at his home in Pakistan where he was living. He would drive over to the hospital in Afghanistan, spend three weeks there and then one week home where his wife and daughters were in uh, Peshawar. In uh, June of 2002, the family went back to Khartoum for a month. Uh, they went back every year for a month. That year, Adel's father-in-law died and his wife and daughter stayed behind to be with her mother. On the morning of July 14, Adel said goodbye to Salwa, his wife, and his daughters and left for the Khartoum airport. It was the last they would hear of him for eight months. Adel simply disappeared. When I spoke with Salwa by phone in April of 2006, she told me bitterly how she had gone to the Sudanese foreign ministry and the WAMI office in Khartoum, that's the charity he worked for, but neither could answer her increasingly frantic inquiries. I had sometimes thought of the people who had been disappeared in Central and South America in the 1970s and 80s. When Salwa had told us about her attempts to find out about Adel and her fears, her tale was chillingly similar to the 1982 movie Missing, in which Jack Lemmon, portrayed a conservative American who ran into a stone wall everywhere he turned as he tried to find his son, who had been disappeared by the Chilean dictatorship. As a defense attorney, I've experienced firsthand how our state and federal governments bury people with sentences so long that they mean death in prison for an increasing number of nonviolent offenders. But until I met Otto, I had never had a case where our government made someone disappear. One of the things that we did after talking with Salwa and hearing her pain was suggest that she write a letter to President Bush. We worked with an Arabic interpreter who's a professor at Portland uh, State University who told us we were nuts to be even suggesting that. He said, guys, you don't understand traditional Islamic culture and Sudanese culture. There is absolutely no way a traditional Islamic Sudanese woman is going to be able to communicate with the president of the most powerful nation in the world. But we're defense attorneys. We don't understand the meaning of this word no. So we kept suggesting it. A letter showed up. I sent it to President Bush. And this is one paragraph in it. Mr. President, how tough life has been while my husband Otto is still detained and far away from me and from his daughters. It is true that we are alive, but without him, our life has no taste, no color, and no smell to it. What can you say to very young children who have no water and no trees, no means of living, and the person who can clothe them is placed in a dark pit? Be merciful, sir, and peace be with you. How great is our need for the warmth, compassion, love, and support of him. Perhaps it's unnecessary to say she never received a response. I visited Adel in Guantanamo five times. Each of them was a very emotional and powerful experience. Each is different and had a tremendous impact. And I think that it is the emotion of the time spent with him that led me to write this book and to tell the stories, to try to share with other people the impact of what our government is doing on some very real human beings. I'm going to read you one last paragraph from the book and then wrap this up.
Pat Ehlers is an assistant defender who was co-counseling the case with me. It was difficult when Pat and I had to leave at the end of the second day of our visit. Pat and I were about to go back to the larger world, but Adele was headed back to the loneliness of Camp Delta, the portion of the prison where he was housed. Pat said his goodbye and shook Adel's hand. I said goodbye in English and Arabic, salam aleichem, and shook Adel's hand. I turned to get my papers, but before I could pick them up, Adel asked, when will I go home? We can only promise you that we will fight for you in every way we can, I told him. Adel's eyes, which had been so calm for most of the meeting, started to darken. He reached out again and took my right hand, first with his right hand, but then with both. Tears welled up in his eyes. He could see the ray of hope that had entered the cell with us beginning to die with our leaving. I put my left hand over our joined hands and we stood there looking at each other. There was no sound in the cell. I'm not sure anyone was even breathing. Inshallah, God willing, it will be soon, he said, and I will welcome you in my home. His wife and daughters welcomed us. And finally, after five years, four months, and 25 days, last December, Adel was sent home. He was sent home after William and I had been in Sudan, gathering new evidence and presenting the evidence of innocence to the Sudanese government, telling them that notwithstanding the problems between the U.S. and Sudan over Darfur, they had innocent men in Guantanamo and that somebody needed to take the first step. The day after we left, Secretary of State Rice received from the Foreign Minister Laum A. Cole a letter that said, let my people go, and that referred to Mr. Hamad as one of the innocent Sudanese. After negotiations over the summer, it finally came to fruition in December. He never had a day in court. He still wants to be cleared, and we are still tied up in the procedural limbo that has prevented anyone from having a day in court in six years. We're waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on yet another case, hopefully to say again to the admi <laughs> administration for the third time that they're wrong. I don't know whether our work actually had an impact on getting Adel home. But I do know this, that as a lawyer, I brought him hope. I do know that in the cell in Guantanamo, the black Muslim Sudanese and the white Jew from Brooklyn found a common humanity. I know that this country for all its warts and scabs, allowed me and paid me to fight it, allowed me to fight for my ideals, allowed me as I think no other country in the world would allow a group of lawyers it pays to go unleashed into the battle against it. And at the end of the day, I think that it is very important for all of us who can get concerned, upset, angry, and despondent about some of the policies that we have been experiencing to remember that there is a significant difference between the freedoms that we enjoy and the freedoms that exist in other places in the world. And on that note, I will stop, answer questions, and if anyone wants to buy a book, I will be happy to sign it. Thank you. Yes, sir. If, if you get if some of these guys out and they go back and kill somebody, you should be indicted for triggering the murder, shouldn't you? I certainly don't agree with that. Well, I mean, you're, you're, in a, this, you're in a conspiracy to, and to undermine the U.S. and kill U.S. citizens. I am in a conspiracy with nobody. 
I am assigned by the United States District Court and the United States Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. to fulfill. Well, no, no, what? I mean, you want this? I mean, you want, I mean, this is the whole thing. I mean, if there are people here who want to blow up American cities, we should know. Let me finish the answer, if you don't mind. I am fulfilling the highest ideal of the founders of this country who recognized in the 1770s and 80s that the power of the state was something that could become oppressive and put into the Constitution not only the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, but also the right to counsel in the Sixth Amendment, recognizing that if the state was going to bring power to bear on people to either prosecute and imprison or prosecute and execute, the playing field needed to be balanced. That is the American ideals reflected in the Constitution. And the judiciary, which today, in the form of the appointment to me, is predominantly from conservative Republican judges appointed by Presidents Reagan, Bush I, and Bush II, is fulfilling that ideal by bringing the federal defenders in. There may be lawyers who occasionally cross the line and engage in criminal conduct, but no lawyer, sir, who is representing a client is engaging in a conspiracy with that client. I'll take the next question. Yes, ma'am. There have been, as far as I know, roughly 800 men who have been in and out of Guantanamo since the first prisoners were brought there in January of 2002. And there are probably 800 different stories. The analysis of the military's data shows, as I said earlier, that very few were actually picked up on battlefields. Of our seven clients, we have one who was arrested in his home in Pakistan in the middle of the night. We have one who was arrested in the home of another man in Afghanistan where he had gone for medical treatment. And we tracked down his route of travel. Uh, he had been in exile in Pakistan during the Soviet-Afghan uh, wars. He lost his eye to a Soviet uh, bomb and went back to Afghanistan only after the fall of the Taliban uh, regime. And uh, we traced his path. We found everyone. We found the doctor who treated him when he was ill in uh, Afghanistan. So that's uh, there. Third one of our clients was in a uh, prison. He was a prisoner of the Taliban. He'd spent 18 months being tortured by the Taliban. While being tortured, he had made a video uh, in which he said, I repent my years as a US and Israeli spy. I repent my years of homosexual activity. I will henceforth live solely as a heterosexual jihadist, and I want to fight. You know, Arlo Guthrie, Alice's Restaurant, if anyone remembers that song, you know, I want to kill, I want to kill in, in the song. Well, on the video, that's what he says, a video made under torture. After he was liberated from the Taliban prison by our forces, a tape made under torture was discovered in the home of a nasty Taliban figure. It got into the hands of Attorney General Ashcroft, who held a press conference late January of 2002, and the Taliban prisoner became an American prisoner. Uh, he was originally from uh, Syria and, uh, you know, had not gone back to Syria after the liberation uh, by, the, by the Americans. There were five men who had remained in the prison. Another one of our clients um, had fought uh, with the Northern Alliance 
and uh, had killed Taliban people. The war ends. He's with the Northern Alliance. Roughly a year later, in a vendetta, the Afghanis turned him in to the Americans. Those are among the stories, and we could go through all 800. There are other people who were picked up in Pakistan. There are people who were picked up in Bosnia. There are people who were a, a group of Chinese Uyghurs, Chinese Muslims from Xinjiang province, who were living in Afghanistan trying to get to the Afghan-Pakistani border and were thrown into the mix, never fought anybody. The U.S. recognized very early on that many of them were innocent and there by mistake. Five were let go uh, to Albania, which is one of these wonderful little sidelights here. The former client state of China was the only country in the world willing to take these men in. So desperate, I guess, the Albanians were to get into the uh, European Union that uh, you know, that's how they curried favor with us. The day after the Uyghurs got there, the Chinese said, we want them and they're still living in Albania. No other Uyghurs have been sent anywhere. Some more of the stories. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, I realize that Guantanamo is sort of a top subject limbo, but I am surprised and maybe ill informed that of all the prisoners who have been released from Guantanamo, nobody has been able to yeah. The question is about uh, is there any civil recourse for the Guantanamo prisoners? And the answer is no. After the first Supreme Court ruling in 2004 when they said some process must be created, the administration and Congress passed the Detainee Treatment Act which by statute stripped habeas corpus and stripped the right to bring any other kind of suit. 2006, the Supreme Court said, sorry, that statute is not going to work. So the administration and Congress got together again in the fall of 2006 and passed the Military Commissions Act, which makes even more clear that there is no right to bring a civil suit. Civil suits have been filed. And the circuit court in the District of Columbia has ruled that they have no right to be in court. That has not yet gone to the Supreme Court, but that's where things stand. By statute, they cannot sue. Yes? <laughs> the epilogue to Brandon's story. It's a long, bloody epilogue. There have been studies by the FBI about how the fingerprint mistake was made, uh, confirmation bias, blinders on. There was a study by the inspector general. There was a civil suit. Uh, the civil lawyers uh, managed to get Brandon a very, very nice settlement from the government. Uh, the, the details are in the book. I, it's just too long to talk about. Uh, the FBI was 100 percent wrong in its identification and why and how that mistake was made and why and how uh, things can be changed is, is described in, in some detail. Uh, hopefully not in technical terms, it's intended to be for a lay audience, but um, you know, there, there's no question that from the perspective of the fingerprint experts, the FBI process was not one that followed any reasonable scientific method. One person looks, and instead of having a blind second study, the first guy says, hey, I made a, 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 a match here. Come on over and look over my shoulder. And I don't know if those are the exact words, but that's what happened. It was to confirm not to independently test. That's wrong. They also talk about big case dynamics, the pressure to solve a crime and how that skews judgment. Sir. How did the cases that we had in the process of the crime wind up? Brandon's cases? No, uh, we don't. I brought the state bar in, 
and uh, we worked uh, to get a couple of lawyers, one who deals with immigration, one who deals with domestic relations, which was the, the core of his practice, to help out. And uh, the reality is that Brandon's practice suffered considerably, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he was released after 19 days and that there was a lot of public media, this is a mistake, he's innocent. The unfortunate reality is that people tend to remember, oh, that's the guy who was arrested. Oh, that's the guy who was charged you know, with the Madrid bombings. Well, he was never charged with a crime. But that doesn't carry forward. So uh, the lawyers in Oregon rallied round, tried to help him out after he was released. His practice suffered considerably. And uh, you know, a number of clients left. He is slowly uh, but surely rebuilding and moving forward. But it is not an easy road for him. Yes? Um, I just wanted to say that I have a great deal of time to the It's very, very difficult. And it's very George uh, Bologna and the committee for this time to not even have a good My question is of the, you know, 800 or so detainees that have been there, um, mostly unidentified, how many are still in How many are still in I think that today there should be no one who is unidentified. And I believe that the identifications of the overwhelming majority of men who have been there are known. Yeah. The government would not at first release their names. And there was a, an officer in Guantanam, uh, Guantanamo, uh, Matthew Diaz, who sent a Valentine's Day card to a lawyer at the Center for Constitutional Rights with the list of names. Now, he did that because CCR wanted to file petitions on behalf of all of the prisoners, and you needed the names to do that. He was prosecuted, uh, and the government continued the prosecution even after all the names were officially released by the military. And I believe he was sentenced to a six-month term. Uh, he uh, is, is speaking out now uh, about that work. Uh, um, but I, I don't believe that there is that kind of secrecy left. But is that only because of this? I mean, my follow-up question was because he actually wanted to release the information. Would that have been done? Question is, would it have been released without his involvement? I don't know that we can answer that question. You know, if you look at the history of the Guantanamo litigation, if you look at the history of many of the terrorism cases, it does appear as though decisions have been made in the litigation that appear to be motivated by other than purely lawyer-like legal decisions. It would appear that on occasion, for example, the bringing of what the administration called high-value detainees to Guantanamo in September of 2006 from the Black Hole CIA sites, it would appear that might have been politically motivated. People were quite upset at what was happening in Guantanamo. The Supreme Court had just said for the second time in June of 2006 that the administration was wrong. The administration was trying to get the Congress to pass the Military Commissions Act and continue to strip the habeas and other rights. What better way to do that, one might ask, than to bring in people of high value, real alleged terrorists like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Far more difficult for Congress to say, these men are entitled to a fair process and to be visited, et cetera, et cetera, if these men include people alleged to be the mastermind of the September 11 plots, then hospital administrators like Adil Hamid. That sort of thing is there throughout the litigation just before the Supreme Court arguments in 2004. The government released Itshak Rasul, one of the named people in the lawsuit. 
having held him for two years and said he is among the worst of the worst, suddenly, just before the arguments, oh, we'll let him go home to Britain. One could ask whether or not there was a motivation uh, to try to influence the Supreme Court to either drop his case or to think that the administration was quite benign and that no process from the judiciary was needed. I don't know because I haven't been in the councils in the White House or the Vice President's office where those sorts of decisions are made. All I do is look at the public facts and we can all draw our own conclusions. Yes, sir, in the back. Are, uh, there are other places which we said go so from Panama that uh, people are being held uh, by the administration, but in some foreign countries or in some jails around here? Or, uh, and then uh, 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 what privilege is the FBI have? Uh, do they have to have a warrant for the uh, or want to talk to you or uh, arrest you or what? Or, or not? Right. I mean, what is this? Uh, what additional privileges besides, uh, like the police have, uh, uh, have the FBI? Okay, two different questions. Let's let's start with the first. Are there prisoners in other places? There are thousands of men being held in prisons in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and of those thousands of men, there is no question that some are being held without charge, without process, in much the same way as the men are being held in Guantanamo. We know, because the Bush administration has said so, that they had these black site prisons in countries such as, if I recall correctly, Bulgaria and Thailand. Whether or not there are still black site prisons, whether or not, as someone asked me at another one of these talks, there are prison ships, I do not know. And I think that it is uh, a reasonable thing to say to a person such as yourself, write your senator, exercise your First Amendment right to petition your government for redress of grievances, and ask now him, I know one of your senators is a him because he's running for president. Who's your other one? Her. Well, ask him and her and ask your congressman. They should know. And maybe they don't. But they should. Any other questions? All right. One more, it looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. You had a second half of the question. Privileges that the FBI enjoys. Any law enforcement officer in this country has the right to approach any citizen in this country and inquire, just like anybody else. The fact that a person is carrying a badge does not in any way limit that person's right to come up to you and say, sir, may I ask you some questions? And you have an absolute right to say, no, don't want to talk to you. Now, the reality is that if your skin is darker than white, and you live in certain neighborhoods, it might be dangerous to say no. It may be that if you are white and they actually think you've done something, that your saying no may increase the suspicion, but they have that absolute right. Now, if you do say no, then in order to stop you and hold you on the sidewalk, in order to actually carry on the investigation, they need at least what the courts call reasonable suspicion to hold you there for a brief time for a limited purpose of identification or probable cause, whatever that means, some weighing of, of facts, uh, in order to actually detain you for a longer period. In a nutshell, that's WAX 101 on search and seizure law. Last question. So when you were at Guantanamo today, restrict your access to the clients, I'm wondering if you might tell that one about when you can in order to get there, as I said, you need to go through the full field FBI investigation and get an actual security clearance. You then need to get permission from the military. And there is a process now set up with a paralegal in the Department of Defense who schedules the, the meetings and uh, you have to book your interpreter and you have to book your, your plane uh, reservation. It's just 
regular, typical, bureaucratic nonsense that we all experience in every aspect of our lives. With the occasional twist and turn, for example, recently the Department of Defense decided to take back the security clearances of a number of the Arabic and Farsi interpreters we have been using now for uh, four years. So all the lawyers have visits scheduled, have the plane tickets, and suddenly, for some reason, not one, but several of these security clearances are withdrawn. So we keep getting distracted by that kind of, you know, sideshow. You know, all we want is to have a day in court for our clients. Let a judge take a look at the evidence. Statute says judge can't look at the evidence. Statute says the only thing that a court can do, and this is the appellate court in Washington, is see if the military followed its own rules. Basically, however bizarre and unfair and sham-like those rules are. But we can't even get there because you get these sideshows about, oh, well, sorry, you can't go see your client because of the interpreter. All right. Once you get onto the island, you get on the ferry, you go across, and you get to the prison gate uh, at 9 o'clock, give or take. By the time you're through the security checking again and, and searches there and looking at your papers because you're not allowed to bring in anything that is unrelated to your case or that would convey information about current events, you get in maybe 9.30, you stay there till maybe 11.30, you come back at 1, you go through the same process, you get in about 1.30, and you leave at 4.30. While it would be nice to have longer days, the reality is the interactions tend to be so intense and so emotional that uh, it's enough. And you know there are petty indignities uh, that we suffer, but the petty indignities that we suffer pale in comparison with the indignities that the clients suffer. Probably a good place to end. Uh, there are some nibbles on the side. I guess if anyone is hungry, have at it. There are books in the back. If anyone would like to buy one, I'd be happy to sign it. And if uh, you do buy one and you like it, tell Amazon. I understand, since I'm new in this book business, that's an important thing. Thanks for coming.